Hello everyone and welcome to Populations and Communities, which is C4.1 in IB Biology. Let's get started. So first, definitions. Let's define our terms. What's a population? What's a community? A population is a group of individual organisms of the same species living in a given area. So remember, members of a population, they're, if they're the same species, they are normally going to interbreed. And that's how we distinguish one population from another, right? Through reproductive isolation. Now, a community is a group of populations living in an area and interacting with one another. So basically, all of the interacting organisms in an ecosystem. So this includes plants, animals, fungi, bacteria, you name it. So... How do we estimate the size of a population? So it's normally impossible to count every single individual in a population. So we normally have to do random sampling where you take a small portion of the population. Uh, remember, if it's random, right, every member of the population has an equal chance of being selected. How do we do that? Well, for sessile organisms, those are the ones that do not move. You can do random quadrant sampling. So here on the left. So you basically take a square frame place it at random positions in the habitat, and then record the number of organisms present each time. Now, for motile organisms, the ones that do move, you can use the capture mark release recapture method. How does this work? You basically capture as many individuals as you can in the area, then you mark them with tags um, such as paint, and then you release them. You then recapture some and count how many are marked. And then you use this index, which is called the Lincoln Index, to calculate the population size. Now, there's a lot of assumptions that goes uh, into this method. So first, there must be no migration in or out of the population. There cannot be deaths or births. The marked individuals need to have the same chance of being captured on the second occasion. So the mark cannot be too obvious. The marks cannot be removed and the marks should not increase the chance of predation. So again, they need to be quite inconspicuous. Remember all of this, it was in the specimen paper. Okay. Next, the carrying capacity, which also has to do with the population size. So basically, populations take materials from the environment, such as water, light, oxygen, or food. So the larger the population, the more resources they need. At some point, there's just not going to be enough. So there's going to be competition between the individuals. Uh, therefore, there's going to be a maximum size of the population, and that is called the carrying capacity. So if you just had animals reproducing alone, you would have exponential growth in the population, right? Uh, but in reality, it's controlled through negative feedback. And that is controlled through density-dependent factors. Okay, so what are density-dependent factors? Density-dependent factors depend on the population density, basically, as the name entails, right? So density-independent factors have the same effect, however large the size of the population. So for example, a flood or a forest fire, right? It doesn't matter how big the population is, it's just gonna kill everything in its way. But density dependent factors had an, have an increasing effect as the population becomes larger. So there's three groups. There's competition, there's predation, and there's infectious disease. And these three keep the population in check, okay? So that causes this exponential to eventually stabilize or even fall, right? Because the carrying capacity has been reached. And that's why we see this sigmoid curve, right? This S shape. Great. Before we continue, I want to take 10 seconds to say that all of these slides, all the way up to theme D, including extensive notes for each slide, are now available on my website. And if you're not convinced, you can get a sample for free to check it out. But back to the video now. Interspecific relationships. What are they? So that is a relationship that exists between individuals of the same species, usually in the same population, just because they're in the same area, right? They're in the same place. So two main categories are competition and cooperation. So competition is when resources are scarce and the members of the population share the same ecological niche. So competition leads to natural selection, such as competition for light and plants, uh, competition between flowering plants for insects uh, to pollinate, competition for breeding sites and animals, competition for food, etc. Now, cooperation um, provides a strong advantage to the individual because all of them benefit, right? So, for example, uh, hunting in packs, right, or communal roosting to preserve heat, parental care are all examples of this. Now we have interspecific relationships. So, interspecific relationships happen between different species, right? So, members of different species in the community. We have these six you really need to remember this. So herbivory, right? This is a relationship where a consumer feeds on producers. Predation, where one consumer kills another consumer. 
competition where two species are using the same resource so they compete for it mutualism where two species live in close association and both benefit parasitism where one species lives inside another or on the outer surface and the host is harmed but the one that's a parasite benefits and pathogenicity where one species lives inside another species and causes disease in the host great so let's look at mutualism three examples so Many plants in the Fabaceae family, so these are legumes, develop a mutualistic relationship with rhizobium. So rhizobium are bacteria, and these bacteria appear in the root nodules, okay? These root bulbs you see, those are root nodules, and rhizobium bacteria appear there. This provides protection to the bacteria. It also gives the bacteria supplies of sugars made by photosynthesis and maintains a low oxygen concentration that they need down in the earth. But it also provides nitrogen in the form of ammonium to the plant which prevents nitrogen deficiency. Uh, this is often a problem for this type of plant, right? A nitrogen deficiency. So the bacterium helps with that. Second one, orchids. Orchids associate with the fungus mycorrhizae. So the orchids, again, supply sugars made by photosynthesis to the fungus, and the fungus supplies ammonium. Surprise. Uh, this is super important, especially when the orchid is a seedling. Thirdly, hard corals. So hard corals, what they do is they absorb algae into their cells and they form a mutualistic relationship. So the coral cell provides, again, a safe environment for the algae. Um, also, it gives the algae carbon dioxide produced by cell respiration. And the algae then provide carbon compounds and oxygen produced by photosynthesis. So win-win. Another type of interspecific relationship we need to look at is competition. So we're specifically looking at endemic species. Those are the ones that occur naturally in an area. And then invasive species are the ones that are introduced by humans, which spread rapidly. This normally happens because of a competitive advantage, right? Um, the species that's just been introduced is not limited by density dependent factors, right? Because the pests or predators uh, from its natural habitat are not there. Uh, whereas those for the endemic species are. So the invasive species normally has a huge advantage and it kicks out the endemic species, right? Through competition for resources. This can often lead to the endemic species being extinct. For example, red lionfish are endemic in parts of the Indo-Pacific, um, but after escapes from aquariums in Florida, they have multiplied in Florida and the Caribbean uh, since there's no predators there and they've established territories where other fish are aggressively excluded. So this is considered an invasive species in Florida. Great. So to look for interspecific competition, right, you can basically do the quadrant sampling we talked about. And if you want to test for whether they're associated together, right, whether the two species are associated in the same place, you can use chi-squared tests. So in a chi-squared test, you're going to have two hypotheses. Your null hypothesis is that the two species are distributed independently. The Alternative hypothesis is that the two species are associated. This is how you do the chi-square test, right? So you draw up a contingency table of observed frequencies, um, and then you basically use this formula to calculate the chi-squared uh, value, the degrees of freedom, and you compare. I wouldn't bother too much with this. It is in the syllabus, but I really doubt they would ask you to go through this whole procedure. Just understand what the chi-squared is there for, okay? That's very, very important. It's there to test for associations between different species. And that can also tell you things about competition, right? Whether there's exclusion, etc. Great. All right. Next thing, population control. So uh, as we mentioned, it's a very, very important density dependent factor, right? It reduces, it controls the population size. So normally, population of prey stabilizes because births balance out predation. But sometimes in some communities, there's this cyclical pattern, right? These cyclical oscillations. So it makes a lot of sense, right? If the prey numbers increase, then suddenly there's more food for the predators. So their numbers are going to increase because there's a lot of resources. As that happens, the prey numbers decrease because they're all being eaten up, right? Meaning suddenly there's less prey for the predators. So the predators decrease, right? Uh, because now there's less predators, there can be more prey <clears throat> and so on and so on, right? It's a vicious cycle. So this fits into the idea <clears throat> that in most communities, interactions between trophic levels are the basis for population control, okay? I'll say that again. For population control, remember, out of the density-dependent factors, 
uh, predation is one of the most important ones, and that's in interaction in the food chain, right? So it can happen in two directions. So top-down control, that's from a higher trophic level to a lower one. That's what we just talked about, a predator eating a prey. But then we also have bottom up, where lower trophic level controls a higher one. So for example, a population of producers might be controlled by the availability of minerals in the soil. Both are normally present in a community, both bottom up and top down, but one is most likely dominant in any given community. And the last thing we need to look at is allelopathy. So allelopathy is when a chemical is released into the environment by an organism and that is toxic to another organism in order to deter competition. So, for example, antibiotics are secreted by microorganisms, right? And then allelopathic agents are secreted into the soil by plants. Uh, an example of the first is penicillium. So uh, penicillium is a fungus which secretes the antibiotic penicillin to kill bacteria when food is scarce. And then on the right, we have the black walnut tree, which releases the chemical juglone, and that stops the growth of other plants. So that's why you can see these trees are super, super small. All right, let's do some questions. So this first one, which of the following is a density dependent factor? Pause now, think, and I'll count down from three, two, and one. C, right? A, B, and D are all density independent. It doesn't matter how many there are, right? It's going to affect all of them equally. But competition for food resources, it's worse the bigger the population, right? Because there's less resources per individual. Next question. What is the best ecological definition of a community? Should it be a piece of cake? Three, two, and one. C. So remember, all the interacting populations in a specific area. So many different species, right? Whereas the population is the members from the same species living in a given area. Good. Pretty uh, straightforward, right? Textbook definition. And last question. Two different species of barnacles compete for space on rocky shorelines, and one species consistently occupies the lower tidal zone. What does this illustrate? Three, two, and one. Competitive exclusion, right? I mean, okay, it's not parasitism because there's nothing that's indicating that one organism is using the other for its own benefit at the other's expense. It's not mutualism. There's nothing saying that they're both benefiting from anything here. And there's nothing about abiotic factor influence because we don't really know the effect that the actual waves or the rocks have, right? But there's definitely competitive exclusion. They're both competing for the same space, but one is consistently occupying the lower tidal zone, right? It's out competing the other. So that's exclusion from that area. Perfect. So I hope this topic was pretty straightforward. I think it's semi-easy. Any questions, leave them in the comments and I'll see you next week for the next topic. Bye everyone.